Hi everyone and welcome to the Cybersecurity Sauna. My name is Janne Kauhanen and I will be your sauna majori and the host of this podcast. Thank you for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. Welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Cybersound. Mikko Hyppänen has been playing the information security game for over 30 years and he plays it well. He's hunted malware authors all over the world. He's provided information security advice to governments and some of the world's biggest companies. He's given countless talks and received more accolades than we can mention here. Despite spending decades studying security failures, he remains an optimist. He's joining us here today to talk about his new book, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable, now available globally, and to explain to us why he's so optimistic about the future. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your new book? Sure, thanks. This book really is about the revolution around us, about the biggest change in the world which has happened during our lifetime, which is the technology revolution or the internet revolution. Um, sure, I cover a lot about the the things happening around IoT and how everything's going online, but it's actually a much larger book than that. I'm trying to distill the things I've learned over the last 30 years while I've been working in this industry and then make some educated guesses about where we will be going in the next 30 years. Yeah, okay. So it's not just about the IoT, but that's what the name alludes to. That's right. If it's smart, it's vulnerable is the Hyppanen law, and that is a reference to IoT devices or smart devices. Reference to the fact that when we add connectivity and functionality to everyday devices, they also become vulnerable in the process. And this wasn't the original title for the book. Uh, hmm. You've read the original book, right? Yeah. In Finnish, uh, it's called Internet. That's right. This is Which is the Finnish word for Internet. Very good. Thanks for translating. The the um, original book published in October 2021, um, we, we tried to use the same name, or I, I, I thought I would use the same name for the international or the English edition, but uh, my publisher didn't like it. And we went through a long list of alternative English titles, but then they finally well, they basically told me that, hold on, Mikko, you have a, a law named after you. We should use that as yeah. the title of the book. Okay, but it's much more than just IoT. Mm-hmm. So what's the reception been so far? The reception so far has been very good. Of course, many people read the original Finnish version because this is basically the same book which came out in Finnish in October 2021. Uh, but the ones who have read the English version really liked it. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about the feedback and the praise I've been getting in the back cover of the book, I have people like Troy Hunt and Jack Reisider and Charlie Miller and Robert M. Lee praising the book. I'm really happy about that. Absolutely. My Personally, my big takeaway from the book is that your relationship with technology is full of contradictions. For example, at one point you say the internet is more like a nightmare than the utopia some digital pioneers envisioned. So why do you think these technologies, like the internet, mobile phones, IoT, they're so transformative and full of potential? Why do they end up causing so many problems? I repeat in the book the phrase that the internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. And and that's exactly the way it is. It, it has brought us so much good, so many new business opportunities, so much more connectivity. It has made the world much more global and maybe a smaller place. But at the same time, it has exposed us to the kinds of risks and crime which would have been impossible before the internet. So it is the best and the worst thing at the same time. And and when technology revolution is big enough, this is what it creates. At, At the very least, it makes us dependent on these new technologies. A good comparison to the size of the revolution that we are living through right now is the electricity revolution, which which we saw 150 years ago. Electricity changed the world in all possible ways. Today, everything we use is connected either directly or through batteries to the electricity grid. And the end result of that is that now we are completely reliant on that. Modern societies will not be able to function without electricity. And exactly the same thing will ha- happen regarding connectivity. Mm. If if internet connections break down today, it's mostly just expensive and a nuisance and painful but it's not going to kill people or shut down our societies. If electricity breaks down, it has much, much bigger problems. And that's exactly what's going to happen with connectivity as well. I'm sure. And, and, and some people are finding that overwhelming. They're talking about how we maybe need to reestablish some of the boundaries and scale back some of this uh, connectivity that these digital technologies have broken down. Is that like... 
for example, in your book, you're talking about the security benefits of closed systems. And that makes me feel like you're almost thinking that it's time to limit what we can do online. Is that the case? And can we really get that genie back in that bottle? Mm, it's it's hard. Um, but the internet is not nearly as open as it was 20 or 25 years ago. In fact, the closest comparison to the kind of internet we had in the early days is, is what's happening now in the Tor Hidden Service, which is mm. very much anonymous and very open and very free. That's the way normal public internet used to be. Nowadays, we're online with our real identities. We, we post to Facebook and LinkedIn and, and on Twitter as ourselves, not using handles or nicknames or, or aliases. That's the way we used to be. Nobody was using their real names in the early days of the internet. So, so it, it really has changed, but the change has been pretty slow. Um, and, and, and we can't go back, but I think the changes that have very practical things relating to our security and privacy are these closed environments that, that you already hinted on. Things, things like iOS or, or, well, a good example is our, our gaming consoles. Mm. Obviously, your PlayStation is a computer, but it's a very safe computer. So when we remove or when we close down functionality, we end up with much more secure devices. And the best practical example of that is, is our smartphones today. Clearly, they are computers. In fact, they are supercomputers when you look at their computing capability. But they are closed environments, and they are much more secure as an end result. And they can be also more private, and, and we see plenty of examples of that, especially with devices coming out from Apple, which really is trying to play the privacy angle in what they're building today. So do you think that in the future we're going to be able to give our users a more secure, maybe more wholesome internet experience through these innovations, somehow protect them from all the, the mayhem that we've seen? Well, we will, I think, divert to two different kinds of technology. Technology required by builders and developers and technology required by users only. Um, we used to give everybody a computer, a mm. real computer. I mean, a long time ago, desktop computers, which could do anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and today, that kind of openness is only really needed by builders and developers and designers. Most users, people who just use these services, they're fine with an iPad or a mobile phone. They don't need access to all the technical things online or on the computer itself. And I, that's what I mean by diverting. We will probably have like different set of environments and systems and operating systems for builders and users. Aren't you concerned that that's going to divide the mankind into the, the technocrats, the ones who understand these technologies and those who just use them? Not everybody has to be a developer. Not everybody has to be a coder. It's a bit sad. Because of course, it would be nice if every, everybody would understand technology <laughs> deep down. But in the end, we don't need to build that. We don't have to train everybody to be a technology expert. We have to have enough knowledge to be able to use technology, not necessarily to build the technology. Think about the CPU inside your laptop mm. or, or the GPU in your mobile device. There's not a single person on the planet who understands how to build that. It's way too complex and complicated. And, and that's the route we are going towards too. I get what you're saying, why not everyone needs to be a developer, but will, will we miss opportunities to include people in this kind of work by sort of limiting the openness of technologies they can use? Well, I guess we will. You're right. The, the great thing about open computing is, is that it has enabled anybody to become the next great developer. If you have a computer, you can create worlds. And the more people, young people growing up, will be using devices which can only be used for consuming, the less opportunities they have to do this. And it, that is a bit sad. So, so yeah, this shift, this change isn't without problems. But I think it's underway already. I mean, the most common computers on the planet are, are mobile phones, and they are closed devices. You can't really use them to develop the kind of things you could with a Windows or MacBook laptop. That's fair enough. So your career in information security has spanned decades, and, and you've uh, been there for a lot of these developments that we've uh, observed. Did you sort of see any of them coming from a mile away, like ransomware or business email compromise or mass surveillance? Yeah, I think we saw many of them beforehand and we tried to be ready, but it's hard, especially timing is hard. Since we're doing this from Finland, the, the mobile 
Security Revolution is a great example. Um, we've, we've always had good relationship with mobile players, obviously especially good with Nokia. When Nokia was king of the world and everybody had Nokia devices in their pockets, we started building mobile security solutions because it seems obvious that there will be attacks on mobile platforms. We've, we were just way too early, maybe 10 years before the actual attacks happened. So we did see the problem coming. It was easy to forecast that there will be problems on that side and we will need security solutions on mobile phones, but finding the right timing is hard. And even when you see the revolution coming uh, and you try to use it to your best capability, it still doesn't mean that you will succeed. At F-Secure, we were the first ones to really start to use internet technologies to build security products. We, we, we were the first company in the world which were shipping endpoint protection updates over the internet, like mm. way before anyone else. We had websites before any other security company in the world. We were providing uh, like mechanisms of shipping the updates to various different protocols. And we, we had the first virus description database describing malware online. I'd like to think we were like way ahead of the curve. We saw the internet coming. We tried to grasp as big part of the growth as we could. And we did get tons of growth from it. But now, 20 years since we started building online services, I, I guess we could be much bigger. I mean, we, we saw it coming and we tried grabbing a big part of the growth and we did grow. And I guess we could have grown 10 times more if we would have just dared to go all in. So even if you see the change, it's not really clear how to get the biggest benefit out of the change. Even now when you're talking about those days and certainly in the book, when you go back to the, the old days of early days of fighting virus outbreaks, there's like a not a small amount of nostalgia and excitement there. Do you miss those days? I do. I do miss the old days. Um, I, I'm not afraid to say it. Today is great. I don't want to go back to where we were, but I do miss the days when we were fighting a completely different kind of an enemy. Um, when we were not fighting organized criminals or foreign intelligence agencies or foreign militaries. When we were living a much more innocent time where the attacks that we were decoding and the malware we were reverse engineering were mostly written by teenage boys out of boredom. And it was sort of like playing a game, a game of chess against an unknown enemy. They would throw their latest creation at us with all this obfuscation and encryption, and then we would spend days trying to crack it, and then we would crack it, and we would be so proud, and we were sort of waiting for the next challenge. It's not like that anymore. It is quite different. It's very serious. It's deadly serious today. And that's, I think, what makes me miss the way it used to be. Yeah, that was going to be my question because some of those early viruses were like fairly harmless. Like they would just propagate themselves and maybe run an ambulance across your uh, screen or something. They didn't like kill people and crash down infrastructure. So is that part of like what, we, what made it such a game and a fun thing to do? Yep, that's part of it. And, and just the fact that the enemy was so different. When I started reverse engineering malware, writing viruses wasn't illegal in many countries. Not, it wasn't illegal in Finland. We yeah. passed the law around 1994 or 5. So it's, it's, uh, it, they weren't even breaking the law. Mm. And, and, and they weren't getting anything out of it. They, they, literally nothing out of it. They, were getting, they weren't getting famous. They weren't getting money. They were writing it because they could. Some of them were writing viruses to create havoc or cause havoc and create destruction. Others just to see how far their malware could spread. And yes, many of them wrote viruses to show stupid messages or play music or play games with the user. And of course, as we're speaking about that, we should also mention Malware Museum, which is one of the projects I'm involved with, which is on Internet Archive, where people can safely run old viruses from the 1990s to see the effects of these things. And we're going to play here a sound from the ambulance car virus. Cool. So as more and more of these devices go online, how do we maintain them and, and sort of interact with them? Like if my internet connected washing machine breaks down, my, my AC broke down just recently. And I was wondering if it's a mechanical problem or an IT problem. How do we approach that? No, oh, it's a great question. And it, it's, it's uh, the bigger question, the bigger lifetime your devices have. Yeah, your AC or your washing machine, you might be using that for a decade or 15 years, something like that. 
how long will you be getting security patches for your AC? What about your car? Even better question. I'm driving a 22-year-old car myself. Is a car bought today still going to get updates and security patches 22 years <laughs> in the future? I don't think so. Right now, the longest time any vendor supports their operating system is, is Microsoft with, with Windows, and they support nine years or 11 years at the maximum, which is already a really long time to provide patches. But over 20 years, I don't think so. So so what's what's going to be the answer? Like, how, how are we going to fix this issue? Clearly, people who are running old technology will require security patches because these will be computers and they will be online forever. Mm. And the only solution that I can imagine, really, which would really work and solve this problem is that when when a product line reaches end of line, the vendors open source the technology. So you can imagine car manufacturer, mm. when the car model, you, you buy a, a Volvo XC90 today, and in 10 years or 15 years, they no longer want to support the patches, so they'll just mm. open source everything, that all the code in the car, which then means third parties yeah. can create security patches. So just, we're not going to maintain it anymore, but here's all the code. You can do it yourself. Well, that's the way they, they do nowadays, the, the physical repair of your car. Like my 22-year-old car, I'm not t- taking it to the dealership. I'm taking it to a you know, jack-of-all-trades who right. just fixes the car. Uh, and they can do that because the technology is open. It's available. Like mm. they, they know how the brakes work. They don't have to buy original uh, brake parts. They can mm. they can buy third party and they can fix it. That's what's going to happen with code as well. Uh, we will need security for old devices, and it most likely will not be provided by the original vendors. I fully understand why the best solution would be to open source end of life products, but. What does that put us in terms of the the right to repair conversation? Are we sort of automatically there then? Well, none of this would work without the right to repair. So this really assumes that companies realize that for products at the end of their life cycle, they they have to be maintained somehow. And if they want third parties to continue maintenance on their behalf, there has to be a right to repair. They have to be open and it has to be legal to repair all things like these. Um, I'm a big supporter for the right to repair, and we really should have it by default. That makes sense to me. One of the things in the book that I, I really want to talk about it that surprised me a little bit was the your account of the Vastamo psychotherapy incident that that reached uh, global news. You're really going into it in detail and 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 sort of candor that I haven't seen before. We won't have time to cover it here, but is that something we should expect in the future to get even worse? I'm afraid. That's exactly the case. And the reason why um, I used Vastamo as a case study in the book was that it happened while I was writing the book. Yeah. The way I wrote the book, because I know myself, so the way I wrote the book is that I had an editor, Ilona, she was working with me, and I had a deadline every Friday. And she was like, no, 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 you can have it, you know, write the book for half a year, and then we'll, we'll take a look at it. And I said, no, that's not going to work. I'm going to send you this amount of stuff every Friday from now on until for the, for the next seven months or whatever. That's how long it took. And I didn't miss a single deadline. I didn't miss a single Friday. I, I, that, that's the way that really worked for me. I was able to get the book out by having a deadline every week, except two weeks. I missed two weeks, which were the Vastamo weeks. Mm. When, when the breach happened, I worked very long hours for multiple weeks and I couldn't work on the book. But I, I think it was, you know, the, the price I had to pay for, for, for working on the case. But of course, then... The case was very freshly in my mind as I was writing the book, so I used it as a case study. And I do think it's an example of the kinds of threats we will have to face in the future, unfortunately. I didn't think that healthcare systems, medical systems, and hospitals was that interesting of a target for online criminals, because criminals want money. And it's much easier to make money by targeting financial systems and payment systems and payment terminals and credit card systems and banks. But as the Vastamo case showed us, is that if you have a cruel enough and cold enough attacker, they can make money by blackmailing victims directly, patients directly. Mm. Pay me money or I will leak your medical information online. And that's an unusually cruel crime, but I'm afraid that's the kind of crimes we will see more in the future. Yeah, so that's certainly a heartbreaking story. But speaking of stories, your book is is chock full of them, and I really enjoyed them. 
Is there a favorite amongst those stories for you? Like, what's the what's your favorite story in the book? The reason why the book has the structure it has is that I like reading books like this, like that. There's facts and 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 you know things about where we're going, what's the development, case studies, and then stories. Like, mm. how, how is this relevant, and and how have we seen this in the real world? And examples of of cases I worked with where the topic at discussion somehow links to it. And that's why I've built so many stories into the book. And having worked in this field for so many so many years, I have plenty of stories. Certainly. I'm not sure really which one is my favorite, but I, I've gotten a lot of feedback. People find the book funny. Yeah. And, and, and one of the stories they, they found funny is the story of when I'm trying to get into United Kingdom during the WannaCry outbreak. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's 2017, I guess, something like that. So BBC called me up and they wanted to interview me for television regarding the WannaCry incident. And I did a briefing with the journalist and she was asking me about blockchain and Bitcoin and how the ransom is being paid and all that. And then I told her that, you know, I could bring a physical Bitcoin with me to London as I'm coming over the next day so we could shoot it on camera. So we agree on that. I actually brought three physical Bitcoins with me as I crossed the border, a five Bitcoin coin, a one Bitcoin coin, and a half a Bitcoin coin. And then when I land to Heathrow, I go through the passport check, and then I go to customs, and I walk on the red lane in the customs that I have something to declare. And the guy at the desk asks me about, okay, what do you have? And I said, well, I'm carrying monetary units worth more than 10,000 pounds, and it says here on the wall that I have to have to report them. And he says, yep, that's right. Like, what do you have? Well, I have Bitcoins. And he's like, "Uh uh-huh, huh, Bitcoins. Hold on, (laughs) let me get a guy. And he goes and comes back with another guy who understands something about Bitcoin. And he's like, okay, how how many do you have? Well, I have uh, six and a half Bitcoins with me. And he calculates, okay, that's like 12,000 pounds or whatever it was at the time. Yeah, that's more than 10,000. You have to report it. Um, Do you have them on your computer? And I said, no, 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 I have physical Bitcoins like real Bitcoins. And he's like, real Bitcoins? Let me get a guy. (laughs) He walks away, comes back with a third guy who's sort of angry to begin with. He's like, huh, physical Bitcoins. What the hell? Physical coins. And he doesn't know what to do with me. Did you show him the coins? No, we were just discussing. I I, I never showed them anything. And, And he's like going back and forth. And he's like, hmm. And then he asks me that these physical Bitcoins that you're carrying with you as you're entering the United Kingdom... Did you report them in Finland when you left Finland? And I told him, no, no, I didn't. And he said, fine, excellent. You may go, go. (laughs) (laughs) It's easier to let you go than to deal with this. I suppose that's what it was. That's amazing. So, you know, but writing a book is, is about picking those stories and picking which ones to include and which ones to leave out. So which ones were left out? I actually just look at my um, folder on my computer, which is titled To the Next Book, right. which has 21 stories or, or, or things I wrote for this book, which were cut. Um, my favorite part about my editor, Ilona, was how nice she was when she was killing stories. Every Friday when I sent stuff to her, she would eventually come back to me. She would read them and, and say, okay, yeah, this is really nice, really great. Let's put this into the next book. <laughs> <laughs> Her nice way of telling me it didn't, no. didn't make the cut. But some of these stories actually are maybe better fitting into, a, I don't know, a memoir or something like that. I have plenty of stories about like when I was traveling the world, because I, I used to travel the world a lot. I saw sure. weird things. I missed flights and were stuck in different parts of the world and traveled all the way to Sydney for a conference, which was canceled at the last minute and missed the Eurostar to go from London to Paris and how... 1,700 people are sitting in the Louvre, the the museum, waiting for me to get on stage as I'm fighting my way through Paris. All of that was cut. Maybe we'll see them in another book. Called The Adventures of Mikko (laughs) Hyppönen. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Uh, No promises. I I have no plans of writing a second book right now. I'm just going to recover from this right now. But a different reason for cutting a, 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 a thing which I had completed in full, but which didn't make it into the book, was a, a, a segment where I was explaining to the layman, because this book can be read by the layman, yeah. 
how exploits work. Like, why are vulnerabilities a thing? Well, how do you get software vulnerabilities and, and why do they become exploitable? Yeah. And the exploit I use, um, I, I picked, I thought, a great example, which is an old language called Senkoten from northern parts of Canada. They have really unique alphabet, which sort of looks like like our alphabet, but they mm. have these slashes through some of the characters. For example, yeah, T has a normal T and then T with slash on top of it. And the thing why this matters is that in the Senkoten language, for historic reasons, when you encode them into Unicode character set, they have different byte lengths depending if they are uppercase or lowercase. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because you can imagine a piece of software which, which is used by anybody who could type in Senkoten. Well, right. Anybody can type these characters. They look like they are normal characters which you can type on any computer. And when you store them in lowercase, they take less space in your memory than if you store them in uppercase. Mm. And now imagine a piece of software which allows you to write a name which is stored in memory and the length of the name is set Right. And then it converts it to uppercase for a reason. Yeah. And now it takes more memory. And yeah. now you have a, a memory overrun. Right. And this is how software vulnerabilities become bugs, become exploitable. And I thought it was a great example. But then when I worked with my publisher, they told me that, Mikko, we're going to make an audio book out of this book. Like, oh, yeah. how the hell are we going to read all these examples with these characters which are unpronounceable? Because it's a visual thing. It, yeah, it shows the language. It's like this character, which looks like this weird character, mm. looks like this in uppercase, and this is how much space it takes. Yeah. We couldn't make it work, so it's cut from the book. Fair enough. One of the things I was thinking about is there's a, a famous uh, communication theorist called Marshall McLuhan um, talking about the medium is the message. Uh, as a way of drawing attention to the way an information medium affects people rather than the, the content. What is the message of the internet, in your opinion? Internet is one of the very few truly global things we have. We really don't have things like these, or, or there's very, very few things like the internet. And that really is the defining feature. It is global. It really is a global network of everything. There is no geography online, which means you will be able to find people like you. There's no borders. As long as mm. you, you understand the languages, and, and even that is now becoming less and less of a thing thanks to, to deep learning language translation things, which means we're never alone. No matter how esoteric or rare your interests are, you will find thousands of people like you. They might not be near you, but they're somewhere online and you will be able to find them. And that's great. And it's also awful. Mm. We're going back to what we talked in the beginning. It's the best and the worst thing. This is great if you belong into a minority. You, you need to find people like you, maybe sexual minority or maybe a rare hobby. You know, internet is the best resource for you because you're re not restricted by geography. And it's awful for, for cases where people have destructive behaviors, people who are planning school shootings will find other potential school shooters and they will prep each other to do horrible things. This is why extremists and terrorists are recruiting online. And this is exactly the same thing. It's, it's the other side of the coin of the mm. same thing. And, and we can't just choose the good things out of this technology revolution. We're going to get them both. What about the fact that, you know, th we have this medium that can connect anyone to anyone else and contains the sum total of mankind's knowledge and understanding, and we mostly use it to uh, send pictures of cats? Well, you're right, but we do use it for something else. Um, we're using it to teach machines to think. Mm. I think everybody who's listening has read through Douglas Adams and, and knows about the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. We're building the Hitchhiker's Guide. We are. Think about these these deep learning, uh, machine learning frameworks that we're building. That this is how we're teaching them. They read through everything we've ever written in any language. They know all the data. They have read Wikipedia in all possible languages. They've read through all the source code on GitHub. They know everything we know, and they learn everything we learn. The joint sum of our knowledge. It's the Hitchhiker's Guide. That's what we're building. It's very interesting. So. After your 30 years of, of seeing security problems, which, which can be a thankless job, as you point out, uh, how can you remain optimistic about the future? It's really easy to forecast the long-term future 
of the internet and long-term future of computing. N- near future is hard to forecast. Mm-hmm. But long-term future, 30 years, 50 years into the future, that's easy. How so? Well, just look where we were decades ago, where we are today. Computers were really big, really expensive, and really slow. Mm-hmm. Now they are really cheap, really fast. They've been getting faster and cheaper all the time. You get more processing power, more storage, more bandwidth. So the future where we head it is limitless computing. Everybody has access to computers with unlimited power, unlimited storage, and unlimited bandwidth for free. That's where we're headed to. And that's a great future. That's a real, really bright future we have waiting for us. Uh, you can imagine that you can build anything you want. Computing will no longer restrict you. You have endless computing at your fingertips. Not maybe in the near future, but in the, in the long term, we will. And even though I've, I've seen all the downsides of the internet throughout my career, I choose to be an optimist. And I wasn't always an optimist. I, I stole this. I, I stole this from a, a guy I met, a Norwegian guy, a guy in his 70s who had spent his life uh, as an adventurer. He had been uh, doing polar exploration all his life. So he had skied through the South Pole and North Pole multiple times, skied through Greenland. And as we were discussing, he told me how he has seen the, seen the climate change with his own eyes, how snow and ice is disappearing. So we spoke about climate change. And, and I was surprised when he told me that he's an optimist regarding climate change. He believes we can recover from climate change. And I asked him, like, how, how can you be an optimist? Like, after everything you've seen, how can you be an optimist? And he told me, well, it's too late to be a pessimist. <laughs> and I loved that attitude. So I stole it from him. It's too late to be a pessimist. I'm an optimist. (laughs) That's fair enough. Okay. So where can people find out more about the book? You can find more information about the book from the web on If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable.com. And the book is available now as hardcover, ebook, and an audiobook published by Wiley. Well, with that, I want to thank you for being on Cybersecurity Sauna and to all our listeners. Go out today and get the book wherever you get your books. I warmly recommend it. It gets the Cybersecurity Sauna stamp of approval. That was the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please get in touch with us through Twitter with the hashtag CyberSauna with your feedback, comments and ideas. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe.